Hi there, and welcome to Homeland's online service. It's our pleasure this week to be leading it. My name's Pete. And my name's Colleen, his wife. And also, I have the pleasure of introducing Beth Powney, who's our speaker this week, and she'll be talking about God's wonderful creation. Now over to Pete for a prayer. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for technology. And we just ask now that even though we are miles apart, your Holy Spirit will speak to us. Father, we thank you that we have the freedom to come and to worship you today. Help us to do it in our own rooms. Help us to learn of you. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are in each one of us. Teach us more about the Heavenly Father and what Jesus has done for us. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have our first hymn now. O oh Lord, my God, we we'll sing about his wonderful creation, so let's enjoy singing.
just love that hymn. I think it's one of my all-time favourites. And of course, the hymn itself is a prayer, and we're going to have a time of prayer now. So let's just sit back, relax, and let's pray. Father, we do thank you that your love is such a great, amazing thing that you sent Jesus. And you sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we can have a relationship with you. But we have to come and we have to say sorry. So we come now in a moment of silence to say sorry for those things that we thought that we've done perhaps we haven't done, that we should have. And we just want to say sorry. And thank you that because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are forgiven. So thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you that our sins are forgiven. And because of that, we can come into the Father's presence and bring our various needs and requests to him now. Thank you. We have so much, Father, to thank you for. Just you being there and us feeling loved all the time, even when we're not lovable. Thanks for all the wonderful, wonderful things that you give us every day that we see the things we can smell, the things that we admire. Oh, you give us so much, Lord. If we were to list them all, we'd take all the morning. So just one big thank you, dear Father, for loving us and counting us as your children. And Father, it really must make you weep as you look down on your world. You love it so much. And yet we spend all our time fighting, arguing, being greedy. And because of that, we have wars. Because of that, we have thousands of people who do not have a full tummy or who are dying of thirst. So, Father, we just lift you now those different countries in the world where there is war. Thank you for peacemakers. Thank you for the medical people. Thank you for those who are just simply serving others. We ask that you will give them strength now. Thank you for such things as Tear Fund and all those who are trying to feed people in situations where there is drought, where there is starvation. Just be with them. Strengthen them now, we ask. We also bring to you, Father, the sick, the needy, the bereaved, people that are needing you, needing your loving arms around you. You never said that you'll take us out of this world and away from trouble, but you promise, Lord, to always be with us through every trial and tribulation that we go through in life and there's plenty of them so father we just ask for a special blessing on those people everywhere and all we have to do is ask for that blessing lord and you give it to us to us to feel your loving arms around us that we're not alone and you put your arms around us. To feel your presence is just so wonderful. And we just say, at this moment, for those that are hurting, for those that feel alone, for those that are sick, for those that are bereaved, Lord, just put your loving arms around them and let them open up their arms to receive you and feel your wonderful presence. Father, we ask all these things in the precious, wonderful name of Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have our reading now. And after that, Beth is going to come and speak to us. And when Beth is finished, we're going to sing that great, beautiful song, Knowing You, Jesus. So over to the reading and over to Beth. Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and we're reading from the New Living Translation. Christ is supreme. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So, he is first in everything. For well, God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Well, hello again. Yesterday we left it that sometimes we can carry some baggage from who our image of God is, and so we look to Jesus to reveal the true image of God. But sometimes we need to form a fresh understanding of who Jesus is, and then the fullness of God is revealed. I wonder how you're getting on in considering those things. Today we're moving on to verses 16 and 17, and I've entitled this talk, All We Can See and All We Cannot See. So let's remind us of those verses in 16 and 17 of 1 Colossians. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then let's read again those some verses from Psalm 33, which just remind us of the amazing creation of our world. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the seas into jars, he puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the people of the world revere him, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. And then my brain goes to John chapter 1 and the first couple of verses. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All of this gives us the clue that Jesus was there at the very beginning, before creation, as well as when creation took place. It was for him and it was through him that it was completed. I came across this quote uh, a little while ago. He holds all creation together in a harmonic balance of reconciliation. He, that is Jesus, holds all things together in a harmonic balance of reconciliation. Hmm. Perhaps we'll unpack a little bit later what that can mean for us. But first of all, What's your favourite part of creation? What or where makes your heart sing? Is it the sea? I love the crashing waves. Sea gives me life and helps me to breathe. 
Is it the mountains? My husband loves to be at the top of a mountain. I don't want the effort to get there, but it gives him life and helps him breathe. Or maybe for you, it, it's beautiful flowers in your garden or, or wildflowers you see on a walk, or perhaps it's babies or a quirky looking sheep with those curly horns. What is it in creation that makes your heart sing? All of these things are what they say they are. The sea will always be the sea. The grass will be the grass and a sheep will be a sheep. Uh, an onion is an onion. An orange will be an orange. Hang on a moment. I'm just going to cut this orange in half. You can't see this right now, but I am cutting the orange in half. Perhaps you can hear me cutting the orange in half. Taking a bit more effort, a bit messier than I thought it would be. And here is half of my orange. Oh, that doesn't look like the inside of an orange, does it? It's the inside of an apple. Well, that's really odd and it shouldn't be there. You see, we expect creation to be reliable, not for an orange to turn into an apple. To be what it says it is and behave in the manner in which it was designed to behave, a sheep will bar and a cow will moo and a dog will bark. But my point here is creation is actually dependable in another way too, not just to do with oranges and apples and onions. We learnt that the image of God can be seen, understood, known through Jesus. Likewise, in all of creation, we see Jesus. Creation shines a mirror back onto Jesus. It reflects his glory. It therefore always will have his inherent beauty. Even the things we don't like, like wasps or blue bottles or mould, it actually has a beauty in how it is created and gives glory back to the creator and sustainer of all. Now, apparently there is something called the Fibonacci spiral and mathematicians among you will know what I'm talking about. It is a repeated mathematical sequence which is found in very many places in creation. Found in how ferns unfurl, in seashells, in pine cones, in the petal patterns of flowers, the list goes on and on. It is everywhere. And as human beings, apparently we find it instinctively beautiful. We are attracted to it. While I said yesterday that there was nothing in Jesus to physically attract us to him, of course, all who met him were immediately attracted to him, but not from his good looks, but because he was the image of the invisible God. Likewise, in creation, we are attracted to the image of the creator, the invisible God. In whatever way you see creation as having happened, this still holds true. God determined the myriad of patterns we see and placed us in a place where we would be attracted towards it. Towards it. it speaks to us of God. All that we have around of us, everything that we see, it was Jesus' idea, his workmanship. He was the word in the beginning. It is beautiful, powerful, and calls out to us because he made it. When the lavish and generous beauty of the world takes your breath away, it is like that because of Jesus. Ah, but you say, it's also full of ugliness and darkness and evil, summed up in death itself, which we've heard too much about this last two, 12 months and some have experienced too much of. But that wasn't the original intention. The beauty is that the very one through whom it was all created, that is Jesus, is also the one who has redeemed it and is restoring it and us. This has all been done through Jesus, is of course the same one who made it in the first place. So this is what it means with that quote that I shared, he holds all creation together in a harmonic balance of reconciliation. Here is the beautiful point of balance in this poem. 
the creator, the sustainer of life, is also the saviour and the one who brings us reconciliation to Almighty God. Jesus, through whom the world was made in the first place, is the same Jesus through whom the world has now been redeemed. In other words, the dead things have been redeemed through Jesus' blood, and that includes us. Paul makes this assertion elsewhere too in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6. One Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through him. And then Romans 8, 19 to 21. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We may not see the completion of this work yet. Creation is still groaning, isn't it? But in the end, there will be no more groaning or weeping or wailing when Jesus returns. So, when you marvel at a sunset, when you gasp at a fleeting glimpse of a kingfisher, when your heart is warmed by a lamb snuggling up to its mum, it's all because of Jesus and is part of the very image of the invisible God. So if you struggle to see God in other ways, if you struggle to connect with Jesus in other ways, go and walk along your beautiful Frinton beach and remember Jesus made all this for our pleasure. So we have explored that things were created through Christ and for Christ and that he was before all things. And we've talked about that which is visible, onions and oranges and sheep and sea and mountains. The next part talks about thrones, principalities, authorities, powers and dominions, that which is invisible. There's some debate about what these titles mean in this passage here. They may represent what was considered to be a kind of order of angels, but there's not really something to make too much of a point of. Because the point here is that all things in heaven or on earth, earthly or heavenly, come under the feet of Jesus. There is nothing such powers can do to influence Christ or diminish the work of Christ in any way. He is supreme over all things, visible or invisible. These powers do not have treasures to give to add to the gospel, such as saints or elevated angels. Neither do they have terror that they can bring to us, for Christ is sufficient over all things in heaven or on earth. I wonder, do you recall the verses in Hebrews 1, verses 3 and 4? I'll uh, share them here in a slightly different translation. The sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendour, the exact expression of God's true nature. He is the mirror image. He holds the universe together and expands it by his mighty power of his spoken word. He accomplished for us the complete cleansing of sins and then took his seat on the highest throne at the right hand of the majestic one. He is infinitely greater than angels, for he inherited a rank and a name that is far greater than theirs. Of course, that is the name of Jesus. As Paul uses this imagery here in Colossians of the invisible and the visible, he is asserting that Jesus' work for us, our salvation, is utterly and completely complete. It does not need to be added to by any other power or principality, nor should anything take precedence above Jesus. He reigns supreme. He who holds it all together by his mighty hand. He is sufficient. The Son of God is the only one through whom all worlds were made, but also the one who upholds them by his mighty enabling word. Christ is the unifying principle of life. We are not separate from creation. We hold together because of Jesus.
I wonder, I wonder how much we are in danger of separating out the beauty of all that we see about us from the sheer awesome power of Jesus. Do we reserve Jesus for our church services or the times we sit down and have our quiet time or open our Bible or listen to a worship song? But no, the beauty all around us tells us, speaks to us, shouts to us of Jesus. They're all intrinsically linked. Paul in Romans, at the end of chapter 8, writes these very well-known verses. For, he says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels or demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. It's relatively easy to marvel at a waterfall, amazing rock formations or the intricacies of a rose in full bloom and go, wow, God. How much do we grasp that the one who sustains all of this, the very creator who was there before time began, is also the one that sacrificed his life for us on the cross. The one who defeated death and rose and the one who now reigns supreme at the right hand of the Father, supreme over all things. He reigns supreme over the present, the future, over angels or demons, over everything. The one who holds the very universe in his hands, holds your life in his hands, and has power over all of your enemies, visible and invisible. Does your faith truly allow you to grasp this? the depth and breadth and amazingness of it. I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine. She came from a family that was steeped in the occult. She grew up in that environment. She grew up in an environment of fear. She grew up being told that worshipping angels and crystals was going to help her in life. She had a, an innate sense of wanting to communicate with God but even when she brought a bible home from school she wasn't permitted to read it and had to take it back to school. Sadly in her life she and her ex-husband experienced great tragedy and her family ridiculed this, this belief she had in a God that was good. How could he be good if he'd allowed this to happen to her? But she thought differently. She thought, I can't go through this alone. God must be there. And so she cried out to him, knowing that even through tragedy, there had to be a greater power called God, who she didn't yet know, but who she felt would keep her safe. He did keep her safe. And then finally, after the birth of her daughter, for she had lost twin boys, was the tragedy in her life. She decided to contact a church because she wanted to give thanks for the safe arrival of their daughter. And at that time, she encountered Jesus. She described it that she looked into the eyes of Jesus. And at that point, she knew. She knew beyond all knowing that nothing and no one can come between her and Jesus. And nothing or no one is better or greater or more sustaining than Jesus and his mighty power. In rejecting some of the things her family believed in, it caused great pain and trauma for her and rejection. But she would still say, looking into the eyes of Jesus is the best thing. So do you know this? Do you know the reality of these verses? For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and all things hold together through him. He, Jesus, reigns supreme over all that we can see and all that we cannot see. May you know that truth in your life. So 
I leave you with some final thoughts. Take a walk among nature. Look again at the detail of creation. Marvel and thank God for Jesus. See the image of the invisible God in these places. Consider what in your life you might think is out of reach of Jesus' power and authority. Take it to him in prayer or go and talk to somebody about it. And know that Jesus is before all things and in all things they hold together because of him. Thank you. the end of our service now we have enjoyed being with you and i hope you've enjoyed it too so we thank you for joining us and we thank beth for that wonderful message about creation so yes we trust that you will be there next week for us when we come and in the meantime, rather than leave you with a prayer this week, we'd like to leave you with a beautiful verse 
from Psalm 84, verse 11. So as for now, bye! bye. For the Lord God is brighter than the brilliance of a sunrise, wrapping himself around me like a shield. He is so generous with his gifts of grace and glory. Those who walk along his paths with integrity will never lack one thing they need, for he provides it all.